Hello, this is Bribery. Hello, this is Bribery. Well, hello, this is actually Bribery. Uh, as you all know, welcome to your first lesson. In this lesson, I'm going to dive into something that literally everybody wanted to do and really it's something that I teach a lot of because it's something that pretty much all producers want to learn how to do better. Uh, it's something that used to not be done by producers. It used to be done by specific people. You know who I'm talking about. And these days, it is kind of expected that you do it yourself. It's also kind of deeply intrinsically tied into the production process anyway. I don't think you can necessarily separate them in many, many cases in many, many styles of music. Of course, I'm talking about mixing. Now, we're going to dive into this and I want you to understand as well that this uh, first lesson forms a little bit of a hub, a little bit of a, a master mothership, if you will, that will splinter off into a couple of fragmented lessons after the fact. So some of this you might know, some of this you might know, some of this might be overwhelming, some of it might be underwhelming. The idea of this first lesson is to get a foundation or a framework together that's going to be applicable in pretty much every circumstance, regardless of what your experience is, regardless of what your door is, regardless of the style of music that you're making and the equipment you are using to make it with, all of the principles of mixing don't actually change. However, if we don't know what those principles are, we very, very easily get lost. So what actually is it? And some of this I should mention, as I said before, some of this you might know, and that's okay, just stick with me, it'll all make sense as we get through it. Let's just set up that foundation. What actually is it? Mixing is taking all the tracks and sounds within a door session, setting the levels appropriately for the genre or the creative intentions. That's all it really is. So why do we get stuck on it so bad? Why is there so much emphasis put on mixing? Why is it the thing that everybody wanted me to do a lesson on above any other aspect of production by a huge margin. People want help with mixing. This is something that I've commonly found as my time uh, in my time as a teacher over the years as well, and I have taught mixing many, many, many times. One of the problems with it is there's so many variables and it's so easy to get lost, so I am going to break it down into chunks. For me, mixing is actually just like cooking. Now, that might seem a little random to you, but in the end, when you think about the idea of cooking, we've got all our ingredients, we've prepared them, and then we're going to go over to our cooking station and we're going to apply a cooking technique to put them all together and serve up a meal. Now, if you take out the idea of ingredients and you replace that with instruments or you replace that with drum programming or you replace that with VSTs or whatever it happens to be and then you walk over to your cooking station and let's replace the word cooking with mixing and you're probably starting to see my analogy. Why I like to use cooking as an analogy is that everyone has to eat so you've probably already got an idea of what happens when you cook? It's like, well, you can easily burn stuff. You can easily undercook stuff. If you don't follow a framework, it's easy to get lost. I'm sure many of you watching this have easily just trashed a meal that you were cooking and served up some hot garbage and you're like, ah, I wrecked it. Well, that can happen as well. So just like cooking, you might want to think that this is your vibe. You might want to picture yourself as one of these people here just in control, really, and killing it. But in reality, it might be something more akin to this. You might be any one of these in the bottom right. This is one of my favorite gifts of all time. Uh, but this might be the mixing process for you. It might be you've approached it with all the right intentions, but try as you might, it it literally catches on fire and another classic gif in the poorest resolution I could possibly find. 
it kind of feels like that. You kind of feel like an idiot sometimes when it comes to mixing. And you feel like, oh, I'm not an artist because I can't mix. And first of all, I want you to remember that mixing traditionally has not been the producer's job at all. It's been the mixing engineer's job. Of course, there's plenty of exceptions to that. But these days we are expected to do kind of everything. And as I mentioned before, it does tie deeply into modern production aesthetics anyway. So it is something that we probably all want to get good at or want to get better at or at least want to understand the process so that you can repeat it. Because if you understand the process, then you can repeat the successes that you had because you understand what you did, essentially. And just like anything, to understand this, we've got to look at it as a process. So creating a mix requires a bunch of tasks and many stages, and they can be overwhelming, intimidating, and scary. Sometimes you are literally just like panicking in a mix. I know I've done it before. I'm just like, oh, this is just not coming together. And I've spent hours on it. That can totally happen because, you know, there's just a lot involved. This is something that I want you to keep in mind, though. Mixing is actually based on context. And this is something that, honestly, I don't think people talk quite enough about. People just talk about the idea of it's a good mix or it's a bad mix. And it's like, well, what constitute a good mix? Because that is going to depend on the genre and the style or the artistic intentions that you're going for meaning all of your mixing decisions are actually context-dependent, meaning there's no one way to mix. There's no true rules about mixing. I mentioned that in my intro video. There are some really strong guidelines, and I'm going to touch on these throughout this lesson as well, but I do want you to know that you might look at somebody else's mixing and go, hey, what they did is really cool. It might not be contextually relevant for your art. And that's just the nature of the business. There's so much variation out there that just because it worked for somebody else doesn't necessarily mean that it worked for you. Now, that doesn't mean you should avoid looking at people mixing other genres because you might be able to take what they did as inspiration and go, hey, how is that going to work in my context? But like I said in my intro video that most of you have probably watched by now, I'm not going to teach you just technique. I'm going to try and teach you how to think about when and why you're applying that technique. So, do remember that the mixing decisions you make are context dependent, so always keep that in mind. And I'm not going to lie, mixing is hard. There's, there's no way... <laughs> There's no way around it. Mixing is difficult, but don't panic. We are going to break it down. We're going to break those stages down, break those processes down so that they are easier to understand. And we are going to look at bribery's six stages of mixing. And again, this is something that I've taught many students over the years and I've honed it over the years and this honestly covers almost every single genre and every single context as long as you can think about it and approach this from a conceptual point of view rather than a, a dead in the numbers kind of idea. So what are the six stages of mixing? First of all, everybody approaches mixing differently but the bribery method is breaking down, mixing into chunks and putting them in a typical chronological order. Now, what I mean by that is literally like, hey, what do I do to start a mix? Where do I go next? What do I do next? What do I do next? Otherwise, it feels like you are a hot mess in this mix. And you're like, oh, I'll pan this. Oh, I'll move that. Oh, I'll add some effects. Ah. And before you know it, you've spent four hours and your session is just a disaster. And the mix doesn't really sound any better anyway. It just sounds different than what it did before you started. So this breaks it down into chunks. When we break things down into chunks, we can specifically focus on each chunk, understand it better, practice that one thing, combine them back all together, and Bob's your uncle, we're better at mixing. Simple as that, right? So let's have a look at what these six stages are. And, you know, as, as I say there, if everyone approaches it differently. You will find variations of this out there on the net. Some people have five stages. Some people have 15. Some people have 500. 
I'm not suggesting that mine is the only one, and I'm not suggesting that mine is perfect or it's the only one true right path. Too many variables. There's no such thing as one way to mix. There are infinite variations. This is just one that works for a lot of people. So, what are they? Six stages. Volume and mix balance. Panning and stereo image. Frequency balance and masking. Dimension, space and time. Dynamic control. Personal flair and style. That's it. Six stages in a chronological order of how you might typically mix something. I should mention as well that I'm approaching this idea of teaching the concepts of mixing post-composition, meaning, yes, mixing is often embedded in the creation process. I know that I will add a synth part to a track and I'll immediately mix it in so that it fits. Of course we're going to do that. Some people might tell you, you know, separate the making process and the mixing process. I know that I've tried that method before and it didn't always work for me, but that's okay. You don't necessarily have to abandon your whole practice and go, now I've got to do bribery's six stages of mixing, otherwise it'll be wrong. No, I want you to just carry these concepts through, especially when you are stuck and you're like, hey, I've got all of the pieces of my composition there. I'm happy with all the parts, all the bits are in tune and you know, I'm happy with my drum programming and happy with my arrangement, all that kind of stuff. I just need to fit everything together better from a sonic perspective. And that's where these six stages come in. So I'm going to break these down one by one because if, if you didn't, well, you know, so your volume mix, uh, your volume and your mix balance. This is often, honestly, where I think people struggle pretty much the most. What level should you set the individual elements in your track? How loud should the kick drum be? How loud should the snare be? How loud should your synth parts be? How loud should the bass be? How loud should it be? And really when you approach that from that broad perspective or that broad question it feels really really difficult because again there's no true one answer and people will always scramble for things like you know numbers on the meters or whatever it happens to be and some of those can help I definitely teach those and I'll be teaching you guys some of those things as well but I'm going to give you a, a broad overall thought at first so there's one thing that can help us and this is my first tip throughout this particular video i'm going to show you some overall just general tips i'm going to dive into them in much greater detail later but i'm just going to softly touch on some ideas that you can take from this uh this lesson immediately apply it to your own practice if you want to and tip number one is get yourself a reference point now by reference point i mean find a song that's loosely within the same genre that you're working on and listen to it and listen deeply to it and go, how loud are their layers in this track compared to mine? Is their kick drum hitting harder than what mine is? Okay, maybe the volume of my kick drum needs to come up. Is their snare really bright and snappy and yours is dull? Okay, maybe you need to bring it up. Have you got a synth part really ballistically loud and then you, you, when you hear one of your favorite songs in a similar style, it's not that? Well, maybe your synth needs to come down in volume. Having a reference gives us a context and it gives us a target, so use it as a guide. Don't use it as gospel because if you try and copy somebody else's mix, First of all, you can try and copy someone's mix. You can't copyright a mix, by the way. So don't feel like that's cheating or anything like that. The problem is, your song is going to be different to theirs, so you won't be able to copy the mix exactly, and you'll waste too much time trying to do that, and your mix probably won't sound good anymore because you, you've tried to mix your song like somebody else's song, but your song's a different song. So it's not always going to work. So use a reference as a guide and it can be a reference in your head like it can literally be something that you're like hey I know this genre and I know that it should feel like this and that can work for many many people I'm going to give you a quick example here so I've got a track loaded into Ableton with a bunch of stems I'm just going to play a little short part for it
So this is a glitchy, stuttery, kind of, you know, retro feeling, kind of hip hop feeling kind of track. And immediately the thing that jumps out at me is there's not enough kick. I've got my kick drum up here. Well, you know what? I'm just going to turn it up and I'm just going to turn it up in this clip gain. That feels a bit better. I'm just going to copy that across in my arrangement. Sweet. Feels better. I just just mo- I just wiggled it around a bit. Now I could, of course, go and find a track that sounds similar to this and pull its different bits and pieces apart and go, hey, how close is mine? But I already know from experience that that kick drum feels a little bit better than what it did before. I could go through each one of these tracks and do the very same thing and listen to it and go, hey, let's put all these tracks on and feel a vibe. Let's check this on and just see if anything jumps out at just not feeling right. Let's check it out. Well, these bright synths, man, they feel like they're poking me right in the eye. So let's take both of these bad boys down and check it out. And I've got this lead track here. It's like 80s style brass synth. It's too low. I'm just going to turn it up a bit on the fader. I wouldn't mind a little bit more snare while I'm at it. All right, now I could go dive into a reference and I could find something similar to this and I could kind of copy it. But for now, it's all right. I've got a rough balance going here. Nothing's stabbing me in the eyeballs for now, so I can probably move on. What was the next component then? Ah, panning and stereo image. People have two ears. Let's try and use both of them, right? Otherwise, stuff could feel a little bit flat and a little bit stale. There's already a little bit of stereo work in some of the percussion of uh, this track that I've got here. Uh, But particularly these synths, we check these out well they're straight down the middle with everything else and I can see in the name here one of them's left one of them's right well let's just pan these bad boys and that's gonna make a little bit of space in the middle for the other synth so it's going to create a little bit of separation it's gonna create a little sense of width and it's just gonna be a bit more interesting remember that the bulk of people listen to music on headphones and earbuds these days rather than monitors and speakers so you probably want to engage those ears maybe it'll be different in 10 years time who knows but for now everybody listen on these bad boys or whatever my airpods are that I always lose them. You know what it's like. Anyway, so now that I've panned this a bit, what's the vibe? Better. I could pull that wider if I wanted to, too. Check that out. Two, two. All the way. All right. Not only has that made it wider and just felt a little bit richer and a little bit tastier, it's carved out a bit of space in the middle for everything else because... That's another common problem that happens with mixing. Trying to put too much stuff in the exact same area and it's just going to fight. So we've got to keep that in mind as well. Uh, So uh, we do our panning. You can see panning in every single one of the doors. It's everywhere. I've even got... I I actually had to Google to find where it was in FL because I know uh, many out there are using FL. And I think that's it. Correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a panning control somewhere. They all have it to move it to the left or to the right. So a little bit of panning tips, try and maintain symmetry, meaning don't tip everything over on one side because it's going to annoy people. You could do it temporarily for an effect, but you definitely don't want a whole mix writing where the left ear is louder than the right ear or vice versa. People are just going to 
feel like they're listening lopsided and they're going to switch a tune off. And that's not what we want. Unless that is what you want. In which case, you probably don't want to improve your mixing. Maintain symmetry. The other thing is try and remain lead focused. Meaning, if you've got a lead component in your track, if you chuck it to the left or the right, it's not going to be in people's focus anymore. I'll give you an example. Let's bump back into this track. Let's find that little lead melody thing that's happening here. It's a little fanfare. If we cranked that over to one side, not only is it going to not have the lead in the front of our focus, it's also going to upset the symmetry of our track. Now, even just listen to a couple of seconds of that is just annoying my left ear. So I'm going to reset that pan control so it's back to normal. So I've got my lead in the middle. Sweet. Now, it doesn't mean you can't move your lead out of the center because that's a misconception as well. You will hear plenty of modern tunes as well where you, you'll hear stuff panning around. You'll hear stuff to the left, to the right. I'm a big hip-hop fan. You'll hear Kendrick Lamar's voice bouncing all over his records, all over the place. So it's not a rule saying, hey, don't do it. Just don't do it for the whole song because it'll be really annoying is really the kind of thing here. And the final one there, the final point, quick little tip as well. And again, this one is filled with misnomers as well. But be careful of panning your bass. There's a bunch of reasons why. Uh, some of them are steeped a little bit in mythology. One of the things is, yes, if you cut a record to vinyl, it will not work if it has heaps of bass in one channel and not the other because it will cut the grooves of the vinyl unevenly, the needle will skip, and essentially pressing plants won't actually cut your record in that state. So there is a real ramification there. Uh, in the digital world, it's not as much of a ramification, but it is really annoying. So if you chucked all your bass, and again, I'll give you an example. Let's take this bass part and let's pull it to the side. You know what, let's pull it to the right. Let's annoy the right ear for once. Oh, there's a couple of notes in that little walk up of the bass that actually hurt my ear. I could do the same up here with the kick. If we pull the kick to the side, even a little bit, if we pan the kick and then pan the bass. this kind of uncomfortable feel it destabilizes the punch of it as well it doesn't balance those bass sounds which are really really difficult for our headphones to actually uh make anyway you know bass is really really difficult for for physical things to do even our ears suck at hearing bass so when we start tipping it to the side all of the systems start to fall apart a little bit so we've got to be cautious of that one and so they're my panning tips. You can check them out and try a few things if you wanted to as well. But try and go for that, you know, maintain symmetry, you know, keep your lead in focus uh, for the majority of the track. You know, just be careful with the bass. It doesn't mean don't pan your bass. Experiment with it. There's, there's no rules here saying don't. But just be aware, if you tip it too far to the side, you'll probably upset the symmetry anyway. And if it's a really brutally heavily bass track, then you might just annoy people's ears. Simple as that. So, next part. And again, this is a part where people struggle all the time. Your frequency balance and your masking. So, every sound has frequencies. My voice right now has frequencies. This click has frequencies to it. Even the noise floor of my mic preamp. Ah, it's actually really quiet. Oh, good. Oh, great. Even that has frequencies to it. You can look up why audio has frequencies to it. It's a physics phenomenon known as acoustics. It's an entire field that you can look into if you want to. We're not going to do that here. But all you need to know is that every sound has frequencies. And if we wanted to simplify this down, sometimes those specific frequencies are too much or too little. It can be as simple and black and white as that, right? Now, this might result in a sound sounding too bright or too bassy or not bassy enough. These are very subjective terms that you'll often hear talked about. You'll often hear people touch on these ideas and they are subjective terms, but they do help us describe and kind of 
regular terms, what's actually happening with frequencies kind of thing. So if you have something that's super, super bright, or super, 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 super uh, that was more pitch, but yeah, get my idea, then you might have problems with your frequency balance. So this is the other thing, and, and probably the part where people go really, really wrong when it comes to their mixing is that when you do start to combine sounds, those frequencies can clash. And that clash is referred to often as masking. There is a bunch of different terms for it. People use different ones. Masking is the most common. And essentially, it means that if we have one sound with a specific set of frequencies and another sound with the same set of frequencies, they can't occupy the same space in the mix. They fight for that space. They're trying always to get in front of each other. The most common place where you'll see this is being able to not fit a kick drum and a bass synth or a bass guitar part together because every time the kick hits, the bass disappears or every time a bass note hits, all of the guts get robbed out of the kick. That's called masking. And that is something that we can accommodate for using EQ. You've probably used it a little bit before. Here's just a little GIF of how it operates. And you can see the frequencies dancing there in the spectrum analyzer in the back of that EQ8. You have all probably seen that before where you can sculpt and adjust those different frequency components to get different sounds effectively. And you can absolutely do that. And it allows us to do a bunch of things. We could change the tone of an instrument. So taking that idea of being too bright or too bassy or not bright enough or not bassy enough, whatever it happened to be, and we can alter that by altering its frequency components. We can remove problem frequencies. If you have noises that are present, say you have a very noisy fan in your room or the fan of your computer is going off all the time, or, you know, someone knocked at the door in the middle of your vocal take and you want to try and cut that out. You sometimes can do that with an EQ by removing some problem frequencies. You might also find as well, and again, this is a little bit of a myth that kind of needs to be busted, but it is applicable in some stages. You might find there is just an abundance of bass when you have recorded with a microphone, even with and not very bassy instrument. You'll see this all the time, particularly when it comes to vocals. My vocals have a lot of low end, but it goes down into the subsonic frequencies once it goes through a microphone. You can look up the physics of how microphones work and particularly things like the proximity effect, which will help you understand that if you want to, if you want to, uh, but sometimes that just clouds up a vocal or it just takes up headroom in the mix and you might want to cut some of those frequencies out. I would mention as well, don't feel like you need to high pass every single thing in your mix. That is a common myth, and I can't tell you how many strangled mixes I've heard because people hear that and they think it's a rule. It's not a rule. Try it if your mix is really muddy. Then go, hey, you know what? Maybe I'm going to cut some low end out of some of these tracks that might not need it. But if your mix is feeling all right from a frequency perspective... You don't need to chuck on a high-pass filter on every single track just because you saw somebody on YouTube do it. So maybe hold off and, again, think about when you should apply the technique rather than just throwing techniques at it. The other thing we can do with EQ is, of course, fix masking issues as well. Here's a little bit of tips as well. Just go easy on your EQ. If you go hot for leather and just go turbo on your EQ, one of the problems that you might find is that the headphones you're listening on or the monitors you're listening on or the room you're listening in, it might be dead to certain frequencies. Again, you can look that up. It's often referred to as a null point, but there's other uh, terms like modes and all different things for it. You can look up the acoustic phenomenons of that if you want to, or the different deficiencies or efficiencies or overcompensations of headphones. There's lots you can read. You can go turbo on it if you want on the net uh, into research, but the more you emphasize things or de-emphasize things, the more you could be playing into it. So just chill. If something's sounding okay, you don't have to cut it in half with an EQ. Maybe just give it a poke. I'm also not one of those guys that says, don't boost more than six decibels. Do what you want. Just be aware of the consequences. So 
when you're starting off, especially, go easy on your EQ. Spiky boosts sound bad. Now, what I mean by spiky boost is, let's find a track. Let's grab this snare. All right, a nice little gated snare. And let's just chuck a EQ on it. Let's just chuck on old mate EQ8, my old friend. Oh, did I put that on the wrong track? Of course I did. Yes. EQ8. Let's let's just give that a little bit of more snap. Sweet. Now, if I wanted to emphasize some of the fundamental here, if I did this, and again, I see this all the time, if I do a really spiky boost, you might notice it's going, ooh, ooh. And we can hear when I move this up, you'll hear it sweeping. It sounds like someone's got like a beer bottle and they're like, hoo, hoo. and that's called resonance. Uh, sometimes it's called self-oscillation. There's a bunch of different terms for it, depending on the EQ that's getting used and the way that's been programmed and a few different things. But essentially, the spiky boost are bad. They're not a good thing. They, they always create this uncomfortable resonance. If you need to boost something, do it just a little bit more broadly. Do it, do it more like this. Do a nice little gentle hill rather than a big old poke because that's just going to poke somebody in the ears and it's going to be super, super annoying. Now, if you're trying to cut a frequency out, then yeah, you might need to go super specific and go, ooh, there was an air conditioner outside that was going... And that was this really specific frequency. I don't want to cut it out. Yeah, go for a go for a spiky cut if you need to. That's often referred to as a notch. But try not to do it with boost because you'll create these wild spiky resonances, and people will legit hate hearing it. They'll just hate it. You might not even be able to hear it on your headphones. So, again, go a little bit easy on it. Also, you can't boost what isn't there. And probably this, this snare actually might be a good example. Oh, now it does have bass. I was going to say, ah, oh, let's emphasize the bass and it won't be there. But, okay, let's get something else. Let's get maybe this, maybe this synth part. Oh, yeah, straight in my left ear. Yum. So we can see this big hole. So if I emphasize that, there's... There's nothing there. And all that's going to be doing is just f smooshing it through this EQ algorithm, which they do sound pretty good these days, but it's just unnecessary processing. So you can't really boost what isn't there. Try as you might. You, you'll probably end up just creating noise or something like that. Of course, experiment with it, but just remember, it might not be real useful. It might just be a waste of your time. And I should mention as well, if it feels like I'm skimming off the surf of these, surface of these things, I am going to go through these in more detail in later lessons. So don't sweat. If I'm moving too fast, don't worry, I'll slow it right down later on. Then we get to point four, dimension, space, and time. And this is where we can take our mix that might sound 2D and make it sound 3D. And we do this by increasing distance which can create a sense of dimension. Now, many of you might know what I'm already talking about, or you might not know what I'm talking about. And this is one of the, the, the tools or areas of tools where people either don't add enough or they add way too much. And of course, I'm talking about reverb and delay. Reverb's probably the worst culprit for people slapping too much on it. Delay can happen as well. And I want you to pull back always, whenever you are applying any effect, whether it be reverb, delay, EQ, whatever it happens to be, and I want you to think about why you're applying it and what the effect actually does. So a reverb, for example, it emulates a physical space. Some of those physical spaces that it emulates are not real physical spaces, but others are. That's why you'll see terms used in reverbs like hall or church or room or all these different, you know, physical locations. And they have modeled the sound of their acoustic environment and turned it into a reverb. There's a billion different types of them as well. But what it tends to do 
is it replicates the sense of distance. Because if you pictured yourself in a big wooden hall and somebody was standing at the end of it, clapping their hands, you are going to have this big wash of a reverb and it's going to tell your brain, even when you've got your eyes closed and you can't see your buddy at the end of the hall, it's going to tell your brain that he is further away from you. The closer he gets, the more you'll hear the loudness of him clapping his hands or whatever. You'll still hear the reverb, but you'll hear a change in that distance. Reverb plays with that sense of distance, that sense of dimension. So it means that if we put everything through reverb, all of a sudden, our track might feel like it's at the back of a hall, which might be what you're going for, but it might not be. Again, your creative intention is your creative intention, but, you know, have a think about it. The other one is delay. And this is actually one that's really, really handy if you are struggling with reverb and you're like, hey, it's always too much or it's always too little. In that case, swap it out for a delay and see if it does better because that can sometimes fix the problem. Now, when it comes to your time tips, first of all, use sends and returns for maximum efficiency. There is a bunch of different reasons why you should use sends and returns, and I will go into detail in a later lesson. For now, if you don't know how to set them up, just jump onto YouTube and go, how do I do send and return in, and just enter the name of your door, and you'll find a billion different videos of it. It's not a secret. It will especially for reverb, it will just make your reverb game stronger. That's all I'm going to say for now, and I'll show you an example in a sec. The other things to think of is, if you have too much reverb on stuff, you tend to have a muddy mix and it feels real distant, but at the same time, if you don't have any reverb anyway, uh, anywhere, sorry, your mix could feel flat. And by flat, I mean it feels all 2D and all very bright and in your face, and it doesn't have a sense of dimension to it. And this is that idea of taking a 2D mix and making it 3D. I'm going to show you an example with this same session here, which is feeling a little bit flat. Now, I do have some return tracks set up here, and there's two reverbs. I'm just going to use this top uh, reverb here. Whoa, what's that doing in there? I'm going to switch that off. And let's just have a listen to this track. All right, these synths that I panned before... Shut up, CPU light. These ones. These are a prime candidate for reverb because it's going to push them into the distance. This isn't a lead part, so I'm not worried if it feels like it's going too far into the distance. In fact, I want this layer to sit behind some of the other layers. So I'm just going to increase the send amount. These are both highlighted here, which is why they're moving together. Let's just see what that feels like. You can hear that reverb tail a bit more. Okay, let's listen to that in the mix now. All right, so it's just got this little juicy tail to it, nothing too extreme. Let's take that lead brassy part and add a bit of reverb to it. How does it sound? Ooh. like honky detune vibe to it. Let's add the other synths in the solo so we can hear them all with the reverb. You can hear as well that the reverb is kind of pulling out some of the the interesting tone of some of this uh, this kind of lead part as well. So it can do stuff like that. Let's hear it in the mix. Now, another thing I could put reverb on is the snare. And I could juice that up. But you know what? Sounds like my snare is in a hall. So you'll see here I've got a delay. And I'm just going to add a little bit of delay instead and see if that feels a little bit kind of interesting from a rhythmic perspective. That's pretty cool, but I want it to be faster. So I'm just going to pop open my delay over here and just make that a little bit faster. Yeah, I'm cool with that. Let's go a little bit more feedback. Whoops, wrong way. Yeah, I like that. Now let's hear it in the mix. 
Whoops. Sweet, that's got a vibe to it. I'm happy with that. Cool. All right. Happy days. Got a little bit of extra space in there. Got a little bit of extra dimension in there. I could play around with that a little bit later as well. Now, number five, dynamic control. So if the volume of your individual tracks has too much variation, it just makes it hard to mix with other things. And we call this level of variation dynamics. It might be a term you've heard of before. It might not have been a term you've heard of before, but that's what happens when we take the loudest part and the quietest part and we look at that gap. How far is it between the quietest part and the loudest part? That's described as the dynamic range. Sometimes we have tracks that are just too dynamic and what can happen is it just feels really difficult to place them in the mix. We might turn them up and go, hey, it feels really good. Oh, now it's too quiet. Uh, let's turn it up now. Whoa, now it's too loud. And if you're feeling like you're grabbing the fader and constantly moving it up and down, you can never get it right. That's a pretty good indicator that that particular track has too much dynamics and we probably need to get it under control. And we can control them, but we have to use a tool that is really difficult to understand. And by really difficult to understand, I mean the number one thing that I see students struggle with when it comes to mixing tools is understanding this tool. And of course, we are talking about the old bad boy compression. One thing that I want to get straight out of the gate, because I will talk about compression at a later time in grand detail. Compression is not a magic bullet that is going to take a bad mix and turn it into a good mix. It might not take even a good synth and turn it into a good synth or a good drum part and turn it into a good drum part. It's not a magic tool. Also, you don't need to slap it over everything. Again, I'm trying to teach you all how to think about these techniques and think about why you would put them on something rather than just slapping them on something by default. So what does a compressor do? Well, you might have heard about what a compressor actually does, but here's some tips out the gate. First of all, don't panic. It'll be fine. You'll learn how they work. It will take time. It will take practice. You want to pull your hair out at some stage because you're just like, I just can't hear the difference with the compressor on versus the compressor off. But don't worry. It's not going to make your music bad if you don't fully understand compression. It will just take time. The other thing as well, because this is a, a common trap for beginners, just pick one compressor and learn it. You don't need the entire Waves pack or all the Fab Filter stuff or everything from Plugin Boutique. You don't need 50 compressors if you still don't understand one of them. You just need to get into one of them, dive deep into it until you can really hear what's going on. And then if you really feel the need to get another one, do so. But again, the compressors aren't going to make your music better. It's just going to be another tool. It's going to be like, you know, if you went out to the the shop and you got, you know, five different hammers to knock a nail into the wall and you didn't even know how to use the first hammer. It's like, well, you're going to, if I'm going to stretch this analogy, you're probably going to hit your thumb with all five of them, right? And you're still not going to get the nail in because if you don't know how to hammer, how are you going to use a hammer, right? So... How are you going to learn how to do that? It's just stick with one. If you're an Ableton user, the built-in just default compressor or the glue compressor, choose one of those. They're both killer. Um, there's so many good stock plugins these days that you shouldn't be falling over yourself to get, grab something third-party. And if you do feel the need, there are so many freeware plugins anyway. So here's another thing, this third point. The settings will always need to be adjusted. This is the thing that makes compression so difficult. So don't follow exactly what you see on YouTube in terms of the numbers people use. If they have the threshold set at a certain point and the ratio set at a certain point and the attack and release and yada, 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 it might work perfectly for the track that they are putting it on. But you're not putting a compressor on their track. You're putting a compressor on your track. And your track is not the same as what they've got. 
the compressor is difficult because it is extremely picky into its input signal, meaning it will change based on exactly what is going into it. And the slightest variations will make it change as well, which makes it so tricky. Now, the problem actually isn't with compression, because people blame compression for being overly complex and... And, you know, that's what makes it so hard. Compression is just really, really difficult. Ah, oh, the compressors are the worst. They set them up wrong. The problem isn't actually the compressor. The problem is that what we feed a compressor is really complex. Audio information is really, really complex. It might feel simple because we're doing it all the time. But as an example, if we pop back into this session, and let's just choose... let's choose any of these elements. Let's just choose this, this brassy kind of lead again. If I chucked an EQ on that just to look at the spectrum analyzer, because I prefer the one in EQ8 than the spectrum, let's have a look at what's going on. It's just a simple like this is all that's going on. And look at all that information that just happened in about a second and a half. Look at all that. Look at all those spikes. And if we want to feed that into a compressor, a compressor is actually a very dumb tool. All it does is it looks at the audio that's coming in and it asks for instructions. It goes, hey, which part's too loud? And you set the threshold and say, this part over this threshold is too loud. And it goes, okay, I'll turn it down. That's all it does. It's just taking anything above the line and it's turning it down. How much it turns it down and how quick it turns it down is also based on our settings, but... It's not actually listening to what is feeding in. It's just looking at what goes over the line. And it's like, it's my turn to turn the volume down. That It's my time. That's what a compressor does. It's a dumb tool and we're feeding it very complex information. So as an example, let's jump into this track again. And let's pull something out that is quite dynamic like this little weird hi-hat glitchy kind of shuffle thing. Now... I can see that it's dynamic. It's not really problematic in this track. It's kind of really jumping around though. So let's just jump into our compressors. Oh, I say, don't worry about other compressors and I've got 50 of them. Ah, the irony. <laughs> and let's have a look at our compressor. If you're an Ableton user, switch it onto this view so you can see this happening. This gives you a threshold line and you'll see the audio coming in. we will see it's popping. All right, well, I'm going to drop my threshold so that anything that's above this line, above here, I'm telling the compressor, hey, buddy, anything above there, can you can you squeeze it down? Just that's all, that's all I want you to do. And this yellow line is representing the volume change as it pushes that volume down. Now, we are losing some volume, so I need to turn this up. This is called Makeup Gain. I switch the auto makeups off because they're always too loud. They always boost the hell out of my, my sound, and I don't want to do that. I want control over it. All right, let's squeeze it further just to illustrate the point. Sweet. So all of these bits that are above the line, the compressor is like, I will turn these down for you, master. That's all it's doing. Even though I've got this really hectic glitch line feeding into it, this is what it does. It just goes, it is my turn, my turn to turn the volume down. Now we could make that more aggressive and pull down even more volume if we turn the ratio up. And eventually, if we'd flattened it all the way, it's like, I will trash these parts above this threshold, good sir. And if we made it really, really quick, it's going to start getting nasty really quick. It's going to start robbing it of kind of all of its natural character. It gives it its own kind of unique character as well, but it's a little bit nasty. I'm going to back it off a bit. Let's just give it, let's give it a little bit of this. Now if I switch it off, it's louder without it, so I need to boost it. Alright, sounds about right. And I'm going to show you a hot, hot tip. 
quick tip. Now that I've got that, uh, I'm hearing it, but it's quite subtle. Why don't we see it? So I'm going to bounce this out. And I'm going to call that drum comp one. There it goes. Render, render, render. R E N D E R. Oh, render. And I'm going to add a new track. And I'm just going to bring this bad boy in. Downloads folder. Downloads. Drum comp. Yeah. And bring it in so we can have a look at it. Now it's obviously not as big. So let's make it about roughly the same size. And let's balance their volumes out so we can see them. So let's just increase this clip gain by 10 just so we can see it. We can see the results rather than trying to guess by listening. I'm going to guess this one. Let's go up to about minus 7. Is that about the same size? Yeah, about the same size. Now you'll see something very interesting, which is some of these parts are emphasized more. Some of these parts have longer tails, but particularly these quiet bits in the middle, they got boosted up. And this is another thing that's kind of a little bit of a strange myth with compression. People say, oh, a compressor takes the quiet parts and it turns them up. That's not actually its primary role. What it's actually doing is taking the loudest parts and squeezing them down. But because we lost so much volume, we have to turn the whole lot up afterwards to compensate for it. And it brings the quiet sounds with it. Which is why when we look at this part particularly, we can see, oh yeah, it did bring up the quiet parts. And this is another problem with compression, is people slap compression over stuff and they're like, hey, bribery, why are my vocals so noisy when I've compressed them? And it's like, because you've squeezed all the noise up. And if you had a noisy room, the compressor's going to pull that up as well. So you've got to tread lightly with it. But I'm going to dive into compression in detail at another date. Final thing that I'm going to talk about, this is the sixth stage, and this is the really personal part. This is where you put your touch to the mix, and it's different for everybody. In terms of tips, there's so many things I could say, and these are the three that I thought would be the most uh, universal for everyone. First of all, break all the rules you've ever heard, and who cares what happens. This is a digital system. You can't really break anything unless you turn up the volume of your monitors so loud, if you've got them, that they break something, or you turn up your headphones so loud that it hurts your ears. Nothing is going to happen in digital land because digital is digital. So you can go turbo on it. The problem is going to be, of course, when you bounce stuff out, if it's clipping like mad, well, that's going to be embedded on the track. But hey, even that might be cool. It's a digital system. You can always recover your work later. It's not like a tape-based system where if you wrecked the mix, you had to throw out a $200 roll of tape. No, you can just keep doing this stuff forever if you want to and just see what happens. The other thing, watch every production video ever, anything you find, just anything. And that third point, which is kind of tied in with the second one, try anything that looks cool and sounds sick doesn't matter if it's some bonkers process. If you like it, use it. And don't feel weird about borrowing other people's techniques as well, because that is literally the history of art. There's been this really weird turn in the last kind of 20 years where people are like, ah, you can't do what that person's doing because there's a copy in their art. It's like, have you, have you looked at art in the last millennia? It's always stuff that's passed on and reimagined in different ways. So don't feel weird about going, hey, what they did was really cool. I saw this thing in their tutorial. I'm going to start by copying it and then maybe put my own flavor on it. Remember as well that if you're running all these tricks as well, you're putting those tricks on your own work anyway. So it's already got a sense of originality. Of course, if you just bite someone's style, well, that's, that's not always the best, but it is a learning process as well. So keep that in mind. There's, of course, heaps of different ways where you could approach this flair and style and tips. As you'll hear a lot with, uh, with my music, there's a lot of glitch. There's a lot of stutter in it. So I'll often add some things to my sessions like, you know, grain delays. Like I've got one set up here. So I might take my synth parts that you heard before. 
and chuck them through this grain delay, which you can Google if you haven't heard of it before. Of course, I didn't have them highlighted. Sweet. Oh, yeah, it gets these little twinkles and sparkles. I've got a thing on here called Back Mask, which is maybe one of my favorite and weirdest plugins ever. It's this creepy little beast, which is called a chaotic reverser. And I might take something like that kind of percussion part up here, maybe. Actually, I might group all of my drums together and then slap them all through Back Mask. So let's solo that in. All my hats are going to be way too loud, aren't they? And I'm going to delete that thing that I pulled in before. Get rid of that thing where I boosted. All right, here we go. This is with it off. With it on. So then it's got this hectic little glitch to it. I might take my snare part... Uh, actually, let's take the whole bus. Who cares? Let's break all the rules, baby, and let's chuck a beat repeat on it. Whoops, that's just my snare. Let's, let's break all the rules. Let's chuck a beat repeat on the master. Yeah, why not? Why not? Here's another thing we can do. Let's bounce out the whole track. Let's call it Glitch bounce. Oh, come on. Skip, 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 skip. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, Shimona. 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 And bingo. Save the session. New session. Spinning wheel of death. And... Let's bring that bounce in. So now it's a bounce, right? Let's chuck that in. That baby's popping. And let's grab this. Let's warp it. Let's put it into repitch mode. Actually, yeah, let's put it in the repitch mode and let's just let's just stretch this out. Or oh, too far. It's getting wild up in here. And you know what? I'm totally cool with that kind of vibe because as you'll know from hearing my stuff, I'm, um, I'm all about that vibe. So anyway, let's wrap it up. Final thoughts. What are they all about? First of all, all of these concepts that I've talked about, as I mentioned before, they're universal. It doesn't matter what door, what hardware, what software, what computer you're using. Yes, some of the specific things will obviously change. Like if you don't have a beat repeat in your door or whatever it happens to be, just Google beat repeat if it's something that you're interested in. We are in this golden age of software where everyone steals everything off each other, so you'll be able to find something cool. But the concepts, those six stages of mixing, those are the same six stages that happened before doors were even invented. 
all of those things that I talked about. You can go back through the list if you want. You're like, ah, is that true? And you'll find the same processes existed in the analog world as well because the principles of mixing don't change regardless of genre, regardless of tool that you're using to apply a specific technique. So keep that in mind. These are universal concepts and it's up to you to think about when and where you should apply them. Uh, this is a really simple one. Mix more, you get better at mixing. Literally couldn't get simpler than that. That is that is the biggest tip I'll ever give you. If you do more of it, you'll get better at it. Simple as that. The other one is that there's no rules. I mentioned that one before. But the only rule that you'll find in the computer is that if you go over the 0 dB line on the master, you will have irreparable clipping on it. Will it be a problem? Maybe. It's, it technically violates broadcast laws in you know, some places around the world. So you've got to be careful of it. But you also don't have to cry into your cereal about it either. So that's, yeah, that's something that's important. And the other one, this is more of a philosophical statement, I suppose, rather than a mixing-based one. But all art is valid. If you want to chop something up and go buck wild on the mix, that's your prerogative. If you want to do that, no one can tell you that it's wrong. They might tell you that they don't like it. You might tell them to go walk off a jetty into the ocean. It's up to you. You're the one that gets to choose the pathway for your art, not somebody else. Now, future lessons. Uh, lessons? Future lessons? Future l lessons? There will be individual lessons for each of the six stages, and that's when I'll dive deeper into each stage. Obviously, I'm not going to do it now all in one video because you'd be here forever watching this video and that's not what I'm going to do. So I will dive deeper into those subjects. That's what this is all about. But I hope you've enjoyed it. Make sure you pop into the description below and follow all the links there. Come and join the Discord if you haven't already because it's popping off and going crazy as well. So jump in. I'm looking forward to chatting with you all about it. Catch you soon.